Let's go down the, down the line. Austin, mm -hmm. Vitalik, Steve, you guys are going to introduce yourselves. Tell the people what you do in very simple words, because these, these are not educated people, <laughs> mm -hmm. as far as I'm able to tell. <laughs> they come to TechCrunch events to learn. This is much like a Khan Academy that's very expensive <laughs> and focused primarily on white guys on stage. So let's try this. Go for it. OK. Uh, I'm Austin Hill. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Blockstream. We do a large amount of the open source development around the Bitcoin blockchain. So the blockchain is the underlying infrastructure that Bitcoin operates on. And we also are one of the main developers of a concept called sidechains, which is essentially how can you build parallel blockchains that are interoperable. So when you start, when you hear oftentimes financial industry talking about, oh, we're excited about the use of blockchain or new applications or new use cases for blockchain beyond Bitcoin, we actually do the open source toolkit that allows all these blockchains to uh, interoperate and to be built. Okay, do we need a quick rundown? Well, let's keep going. Let's go to Vitalik. Yeah, so I'm the original founder of the Ethereum project. So the idea behind Ethereum is that it is an independent blockchain platform. And the key property that it has is that it has a built-in programming language. And so the idea is that instead of being a blockchain that's designed for a few specific applications, it's essentially a blockchain that any kind of, where any kind of application can be built on top of it. So that's what I've been uh, w working on alongside a team of 20 to 30 other people for the past two years. Okay, and Steve, and it should be noticed that Steve's Twitter handle is Waterhouse PhD, which suggests that he's proud of his PhD. <laughs> so, of course. explain yourself. Um, hi, I'm Steve Waterhouse. Uh, I'm a partner at Pantera Capital. Um, we're an investment firm that's focused uh, exclusively on uh, blockchain technologies, um, originally Bitcoin, um, and uh, we've. Mm. Um, invested in 22 companies over the last three years. Uh, we were one of the first institutional investors uh, into Bitcoin. Um, we have a, one of the largest funds of Bitcoins, uh, which we hold for other investors. Um, and on the venture side, uh, we've invested in a lot of different companies, including the leading exchanges in the world, uh, mining companies, and then more recently applications. Um, both in Bitcoin and in more generalized block, blockchain applications. So you guys can correct me if this analogy is incorrect. But to separate out blockchain from Bitcoin is like having a goldfish and then having the goldfish die and then pointing to the goldfish that the goldfish is simply just missing the Bitcoin portion of things and it can still swim around by itself, presumably under the blockchain. Is that a good analogy? No. No. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good uh, I'm analogy. Not a large it's a, fish owner. So. Yeah. It's an odd one. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can't. Well, I'm trying to. I'm trying to understand. It's well, my. It's my understanding that the that the that the uh, the validation portion of the whole system allows the rest of the system to be robust and to exist in a in a special way. So, can you separate the two? Can you cut the goldfish from its life? Um, so this relates somewhat to the discussion about private blockchains and public blockchains. And uh, you know, many institutions, financial institutions, have come out recently and said, well, we see a lot of benefit in the blockchain, but we're not sure about Bitcoin. Um, and one of the things that's really important to understand, if you look at the history of these technologies, um, there is almost 20 years of research, 20 or 30 years of research in cryptography uh, that led into the creation of Bitcoin. And uh, I was involved in the early 90s in a company that worked on this. We spent millions trying to build eCash. And all of the previous systems, DigiCash, companies in the late 90s that tried to build this, they all failed because of a central concept of uh, central trusted parties. You had a single issuing agency. And when that database or that agency fell apart, then all of a sudden the tokens that they had certified or given value to by signing disappeared along with it. And so all of the financial institutions were sitting looking at eCash for years, and they said, well, we don't trust the other agency, right? We don't trust this other bank. Who's going to issue the tokens that we trust? 
So you had a massive challenge of bootstrapping, and Bitcoin kind of turned that on its head because it said, we can have a fully decentralized network, and part of the mechanism that it used to bootstrap was the incentives. It said, if you participate in the network and you're part of the mining or transaction processing, you get rewarded in Bitcoin. And this has led to not only a billion dollars in venture capital investment in the ecosystem for companies built in and around, but it's also led to over $600 million invested in hardware. You know, the Bitcoin mining industry has moved ASIC development forward three or four years. They were one of the first to be deploying 16 nanometer ASICs. So we have this massive capacity that's represented in the form of the global hash rate. And the reason that people operate this massive decentralized trust machine known as the blockchain is because they're earning rewards in Bitcoin. Um, so there are some use cases where that's not appropriate. If you're issuing, you know, US dollars on a blockchain, do you, how does that interplay with miners? Um, but it's an important to see that capacity as unused capacity for a whole bunch of different trust ecosystems. Vitalik, you're actually building, you're building computing power on top of this, this mm -hmm. whole system, so. Yeah, well, I mean, the idea about, the, well, so the idea of Ethereum was basically to sort of generalize blockchain beyond its sort of first initial application, which was transfer of values and nominated in one specific currency to basically, you know, everything else that people have gotten excited about over the sort of six years since then. Um, on the Bitcoin and blockchain question, I mean, it's extremely complicated because there are lots of different kinds of technologies. So, for example, one way you could think about the problem is, you know, what kinds of applications do you care about? Do you, care, do you actually care about the currency? You know, if to you, is this about, let's say, you know, the Federal Reserve being corrupt and you wanting to replace the Federal Reserve with an algorithm that just says there's going to be 21 million units forever? Or do you view cryptocurrency? And, you know, it's probably sort of more proper to say, you know, blockchain and cryptocurrencies, because there are plenty of blockchains that rely on, on, on cryptocurrencies other than, other than Bitcoin. So, you know, are you interested in cryptocurrencies specifically because of the currency property, or are they sort of just fuel, just a kind of medium? To, you know, that is Austin saying is is necessary, but kind of is only there instrumentally in order to make some other thing happen. Okay. And Steve, when somebody comes to you and says we're a blockchain company, what does that mean to you when you hear that? Um, are they lying, or are all, they really all, lying? all the same with different names? Yeah. Um, I uh, we've tended to look more recently at. Um, this as a technology, as an infrastructure. Um, and um, I think it's, an, it's important sometimes to take a longer view. We, you know, we're, we're very close to this. We're all looking at it and wondering, is it Ethereum, is it, is it blockchain, is it R3? Like, who, who's, who's going to be the right one? But um, I think if you look at the history of networks, um, you know, the, the web, when it started off, was not good for streaming real-time video, but now we do it quite easily. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you look forward and think about what the real promise of this technology is and where it could potentially converge, um, I think it's most likely that we're going to see um, you know, common sets of open source code bases, common sets of hardware, common sets of protocols. Um, but the question is, who's right? You know, is it him? Is it him? Is it, are we all right? You know, where does this end up? Um, and so as an investor, we've been looking at uh, primarily what are the applications that are enabled here. Um, and you know, in many cases, being somewhat agnostic to the underlying protocols that are used, um, I feel like things will be backwardly compatible with Bitcoin and with the Bitcoin blockchain. I think that the banks that are very excited about this space, we've seen you know, most of the major international banks in the world uh, you know, announce some kind of initiative in, in blockchain space. I think they will end up using more of the open source protocols versus developing their own ones just for expediency and mm -hmm. you know, ease of use and so on. Yeah. And then eventually some of those technologies will find their way out into the open source world again. Presumably the banks aren't going to be connecting, using, connecting to the formal blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, because they want to try it out themselves. It's basically, from what I understand, most of these things, these internal bank things are just like two guys hanging out and like <laughs> trading stories back and forth about how cool blockchain is. <laughs> Like a million dollars in like a, in a UBS uh, blockchain R&D center is like a lunch budget for one of the dudes upstairs. So. Um, 
I've actually seen it advance. There are certain uh, financial institutions that I think are just doing this at the innovation group where they want to learn and they build some prototypes, then they go showcase it internally to different divisions in the bank. But there are some that are way more uh, mature in their development cycle. Uh, you know, I know of a couple banks that have more than 150 people working on blockchain technologies mm -hmm. um, that have, are very f much farther along in terms of business units defining real problems that they're working on blockchains to solve. And I think you talked about Settlecoin? Well, Goldman Sachs uh, made, you know, was in the news recently around the uh, idea of you know, a, a blockchain-powered settlement uh, network for cash equity. Uh, you know, so when you trade in stocks, you can actually do instant settlement. Um, and they're not alone. There are a number of other pe players working on that. Um, we see a bunch of interesting stuff coming out of fintech, but the, one of the powers of open source platforms and open source software is it does lower the barrier for permissionless innovation. Mm -hmm. And that's also very exciting, where we see a whole bunch of upstart players across industries. I saw one recently in the insurance industry that's trying to uh, do transactional insurance for the P2P economy. So if you're an Uber driver for two days of the week and you're an Airbnb renter for the weekend, how do you get insurance to cover those different parts of your use case? And they're looking at creating a blockchain-powered insurance marketplace. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's exciting. That's an exciting use case that shows kind of the novelty. And they're looking at using the open source tool that, you know, frankly, one of the best things Bitcoin has done is it painted a one to ten billion dollar security bounty on the protocol that's been out there available to be stolen. And so over the last six years, I don't think there's a system that's undergone more peer review or stress testing than Bitcoin. Yeah. And that gives people a lot of confidence to mm -hmm. then build on that as a platform. Well, I mean, at what point, Steve, I guess, and I want to talk to Vitalik a little bit, at what point, Steve, are you investing in the old Hollywood way, like, I don't know, Ghost meets Superman, where it's basically Bitcoin plus Amazon, Bitcoin plus... Pets.com, Bitcoin Plus. Okay. Yeah. At what point? Do you, at what point are you just? Are you looking at the top and you're not looking at the back end? Because back end is going to be TCIP, the equivalent of TCIP back in 2000, right? Mm -hmm. The web itself was the yeah was the carrier. We've been trying to really find things where um, you know ideally you're able to do something either orders of magnitude better. Um, you know we have an investment in a company called Align Commerce that's doing wires. They're basically replacing. Um, you know, four-day wires with potentially under one day by using the Bitcoin network. Um, and, you know, the, neither party knows they're using Bitcoin. It's just transparent. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not, uh, not clear. So in that case, it's an order of magnitude better. Um, another company we've invested in is uh, <clears throat> Abra, which is looking at essentially providing digital wallets. Again, no one is using Bitcoin. Um, and this is like a big generalization of what happened in Kenya with M-Pesa, which is the um, digital currency that's used over cell phone networks. <clears throat> and in that case, you're giving people something that they just couldn't do otherwise. You, you, know, you can't do banking in the developing world very easily. And so suddenly you can give them something which they didn't have before. Um, so, yeah, we try to avoid things where it's just, you know, and now with Bitcoins. Um, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, it, th those opportunities come along every so often. I think, to me, it's not as interesting to think about what industries are going to die, like which bank's not going to work out because of Bitcoin. It's more interesting to think what are the new kind of things you can start very easily because you have this you know, open programmable network. Yeah. And what do you think, Vitalik, what are some of the cool things that you can do on top of, you have all this computing power, what are you guys able to do? What have you seen? Um, so one very simple uh, use case actually, since you know, Austin brought up, brought up insurance, there's projects doing that on Ethereum as well. So the way, there's a project I think that got done on a hackathon even a week ago, which is basically insurance for delayed flights uh, like done over smart contracts on the Ethereum network. And the interesting thing there is that the way that that works technically is that there exists a service which basically verifies, like cryptographically verifies, you know, secured web pages and sort of, and sort of scrapes data from them and actually pushes that into smart contracts directly. So the team that's working on that basically took that, took that piece of infrastructure that already exists, took a theorem that already exists, pieced it, pieced it together, pointed it at this one particular API, you know, wrote a bit of contracts code, and there you go. There's a decentralized insurance market. Hmm. Um, there's groups that are looking to sort of integrate blockchain and IoT. So one company that I've started to mention a lot is Slock. They're 
take, they're doing this uh, sort of smart property approach where they use the blockchain to keep track of ownership or of rental of physical objects. So, you know, if you could imagine something like a sort of completely automated system for renting bikes that's just, you know, done completely over a blockchain crypto, crypto payments and theoretically just sort of started up and it works completely autonomously. So there's lots of different things that you can do. And I, for me personally, it, it, it really is a generality and sort of the sheer broad range of things you can do with it that excites is me. Is there anything really cool? Like you can like hmm. render a genome or something like that or send somebody to the moon or whatever? Not. This sounds like, this sounds like it's cool stuff, but it sounds like CPA sort of stuff. But I want like, I want like a, like a <laughs> robot or something. Um, you can have a prediction market on when people are going to invent robots and go to the moon. So you can bet on people making robots. Then you yes. can make enough money to buy the robot when it yes. comes out. All right, that's good enough for me. Mm -hmm. So yep. also talk a little bit, Austin, you had a, uh, you had a vision of uh, mobile, mobile con like connectivity through the blockchain, I guess? Well, or payments, it, right? Yeah, it's just one of the use cases we've begun to explore with various customers. Uh, essentially, any market where there's a lar large number of participants and there's transactional flow back and forth, you can start to look at and say, okay, is a blockchain appropriate? And, you know, so w we have, you know, a group that's working on a pilot around uh, data access. So the entire concept of roaming and carriers cross-billing each other and how infrastructure players are paid in those markets could actually be tokenized where you have uh, you know, a marketplace where you can buy minutes essentially in tokenized form and you could create a lot of efficiencies not only on the back end billing processing but then you have a, a more efficient market for being able to buy or source data roaming minutes. Um, you know, and that's just one use case. We've seen people start to use blockchains for virtual worlds. When you start getting into, you know, an Oculus Rift virtual world kind of idea, how are you going to own objects in the virtual world? How do you transfer objects from one avatar to another? How do you create scarcity in virtual worlds when digital objects are normally duplicated very easily? Um, so they're looking at blockchain infrastructures to actually manage every asset in the virtual world. Um, so those are some exciting use cases we've seen. But one of the biggest ones is in the area of finance, trade. Uh, we saw, you know, we, there's a company out of Hong Kong that's working on an international uh, trade financing mechanism so that when you supply, you source goods from uh, Hong Kong and your container shows up to be delivered, funds can get automatically released out of escrow. Like so that entire process could be encoded on a blockchain and automated. Okay, so let's do the world a favor. So there are journalists who write about blockchain, there's the world who wants to pitch blockchain ideas. So why don't we change the name of like a blockchain-based startup to something different? So it's abundantly clear that it's not blockchain divorce from Bitcoin or the, the whole, the whole uh, system there, but it's something completely different. So how could we, what could we call a startup that, uh, instead of a blockchain startup? This is going to help you guys too. This is going to, <laughs> this is going to help everybody. Well, um, I actually think that's somewhat marketing games, right? Um, well, let's, we're playing marketing yeah. games. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, and some people have do, done this. Do some we have to use have... the word disrupt? <laughs> it has to be. It has the okay. disruptive dot disrupt. something. Disruptive decentralized. Decentralized. Well, we've heard uh, uh, distributed ledger technology. But not ledger. Um, that's not, but that's not a thing. like an yeah. accounting thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I well, the, the, the term that I use often enough is crypto 2.0, which, yeah, you know, it, so it sounds ambitious and it does sound yeah, sort of auto encompassing, but the reason why I like it is precisely because it's sort of extremely broad. It even takes into account, you know, really cool stuff like IPFS that technically isn't even a blockchain at all, but it's still, you know, sort of philosophically okay. really in the, in crypto the same 2. place. Crypto 2.0. All those in favor? <laughs> you don't like it? Well, I like decentralized too. There's decentralized a, there's crypto a lot, There's a lot in crypto that isn't blockchain. Yeah. Uh, well, these words are so scary. Like yeah. Crypt, crypto. Yeah. yeah, the consensus model is failing on this, um, this guy. But I, I, I like yeah. the a, a general approach to thinking about blockchains is programmable trust infrastructure. Because you can really start to program your trust and the rules or the concept. And that's one of the key benefits, is you can remove systemic risk. The blockchain acts as a real-time, a priori audit mechanism. And when you start to get into you know, a longer-term view, that gets really exciting. Like, you know, the entire idea of audits. You know, right now we have auditors who come in once a quarter and spot-check transactions 
hoping to find something that was good or bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have autopsy audits that come in like after Enron and say, oops, we missed something and the company's gone. Okay, so disruptive, <laughs> crypto 2.0, uh, decentralized, distributed trust something at the end there. Yeah. We got it. It's perfect. All right. Okay. <laughs> you guys have been great. Hopefully this was helpful for all people who are trying to understand blockchain. Thank you very much, Vitalik. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Austin. Thank you. Great. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks, dude.